What's going on? Welcome to another episode of Crime Pays But Botany Doesn't. I'm here in beautiful South Texas, nearly a stone's throw from the lovely metropolis of Corpus Christi. And we're here to check out a vestigial little pond that offers us a glimpse into the past of what the region may have looked like before all this stupid shit behind me in the background uh, got put up, like the windmills and the uh, uh, very toxic monoculture agriculture of cotton which smells very toxic right now. I, I do have to say, it smells like literal cancer. Like, I think they, I'm pretty sure they just sprayed. Anyway, we're gonna go look at this pond. All right, trespassing is a social taboo and a crime in Texas. The whole state is like 96% private property. Very little public land here, uh, especially public land that doesn't require a fee to access it. All that aside, the real crime that's going to occur today is the fact that I'm so close the lovely Corpus Christi, and I'm not going to go visit the Selena statue, which I last visited in 2005, and it was a fantastic experience. So I'm going to be self-flagellating on the whole fucking ride home and listening to a more prohibito. That said, let's go check out the plants that are growing here. They're all aquatics. One only occurs in a few, a handful of sites in South Texas, and the rest of the population is in Mexico. It's actually up for potentially being listed as endangered, and uh, the rest of the aquatic plants here are somewhat common, but still... Very cool. Let's go check it out. Oh, God, that looks terrible. I really can smell. It smells bad. What is that? Fucking pluriquat? What's the name of these? I love how all the very toxic uh, herbicides have awful sounding names. Like, they just sound like a cancer diagnosis. Jesus Christ, look at it. It looks like, was that a fire up there? Why is it all black? Is it axle grease? Maybe it's axle grease. Maybe it got struck by lightning. I don't know. Anyway, here's all the cotton. Got it. Just, <laughs> just, I'm wearing Crocs, too. Oh, it's terrible. I'm getting I'm getting skin exposure. I'm gonna have to take a fucking decontamination bath after this. Anyway, the first plant we're gonna start off with is probably the coolest, and it's this guy right here, Heteranthera mexicana, which you can see with these lovely blue flowers. All right, the whole genus Heteranthera is in the order Comelinales and the family Pontederiaceae. You can see these kind of pubescent glandular stems with the little uh, glandular hairs, little glandular trichomes. You've also got those two inflated anthers. The whole genus Heteranthera is pretty cool. They've got some very weird flower shapes, uh, just like uh, their, their sister family, Comelinaceae. You get some really weird stamen and anther shapes. You can see you've got those two little inflated anthers, probably to attract bees. I wonder if these are buzz pollinated too. Probably not. Uh, I don't see pores there. Maybe I'm wrong. But you do have an antheostyle occurring, which is where the style swings to the left or the right. And that's uh, that's a gimmick that these flowers employ to uh, basically to get cross pollination, to make sure that they can only be pollinated uh, with pollen from different flowers, ideally on different plants that uh, that have a style swing to the other side. So look at this flower diagram. You got those two juicy inflated anthers, which are clearly attracting the pollen collecting bees. They're flashy, they're conspicuous. And then you've got the fertile stamen, that little black thing going off to the side, which means the pollen will only be deposited on one side of the bee's body. Thus the bee will only be able to pollinate and deposit that pollen on a stigma that hits that side of the bee's body, a mirror image flower. And I wonder if we'll see some flowers that have styles going off to the left. Anyway, Heteranthera is a really cool genus. You should become familiar with it. We just saw Heteranthera dubia in the San Marcos River. Heteranthera dubia is a little bit more common, uh, but equally cool. And so the Heteranthera can also, I mean, it can be submerged and it can also be emerged. So it can have submergent leaves and then also have uh, emergent leaves like you see here with, uh, <coughs> look at it, all inflated. They look at like inflated hollow shoots. Oh yeah, and they're, they're very slippery. Slippery when wet with those, that glandular pubescence. But there's a flower where the style swings off to the left, to the flower's right to my left. Again, Enantiostyle, which I've seen in the genus Wachendorphia down there in uh, South Africa and also in Solanum rostratum, which you get here in Texas. Always makes sense to look at flowers, man. You gotta look, gotta look up close. A lot of them are doing weird shit. They've got weird gimmicks they're employing to get pollinated. Every flower is like a puzzle. I always say that. Look close at the goddamn flower morphology. You can tell a lot about a flower just by looking at it. What pollinates it, how it's, uh, how it's getting it done, if it's male or female, if the, if the plant is you know bisexual, monoecious, or dioecious. Anyway, there you go. Heteranthera mexicana, a very rare plant in the United States, only, only known and collected from a handful 
not even, uh, of sites in, uh, in South Texas. Next up, we got this guy, member of the pomegranate family and the dreaded crepe myrtle family, Lithraceae. You got opposite leaves. You got a glabrous stem. Those leaves are clasping. Almost looks uh, perfoliate. They're certainly sessile. And uh, what you're looking at next to that leaf is a uh, emerging flower bud that is not mature. Here, going further down the shoot, you can see flowers that just did mature. And uh, that looking at that flower should tell you automatically what uh, what family this is and you can tell this is lithraceae that's the typical lithraceae flower shape just like cufea and lithrum and diplucidon in brazil uh, normally they have six petals this only has five anyway this is amania coccinia pretty widespread and uh when you look at the fruit what the fruit looks like let's see where we can find a the fruit there you go there's some fruits maturing little little green capsules that'll turn brown dry out and release a bunch of seeds so that was the ovary that was inside the flower when these were blooming, you know, a few weeks ago. And that same thing will happen to these flowers up here. So it, uh, you know, the flowers mature from the bottom up. Anyway, Amania coccinia, Lithraceae, pomegranate family, loose strife family, growing here in the mud and uh, also uh, occurring uh, over there where it's uh, actually submerged. And here it is, dainty little aster, this dainty little composite, dainty little fucking daisy, Trichocoronis ridei. As you can see right there, just a little, just a little white member of the sunflower family, but also uh, an aquatic plant that's got a, uh, a wetland. Well, it's a wetland plant, but it's got a pretty, uh, pretty you know, narrow distribution. Only occurring in Mexico and the Gulf Coastal Bend of Texas. Uh, maybe not as far east as Houston. Look at all the damn hairs on that thing. Got opposite leaves. The leaves, uh, the leaves are hairy along the vein. And they're hairy on the stem. This is a rare one too. Supposedly there's a population in Baja, according to iNaturalist, but uh, I don't know. I haven't I haven't looked at it. El Chico del Apartamiento Cinco Doce. El Jase. Oh shit, these fucking clogs. God, that's a problem with clogs. They get stuck. See, now I'm taking a bath in the toxic chemicals. The toxic chemical runoff from the fucking cotton fields. This is really bad for me. But I'm doing it for you because it does look like there's some really cool shit here. You can see that heteranthera is still going off. And of course, we still have uh, a Sagittaria here. You can see uh, it's got those arrow-shaped leaves for which the genus is named. Sagittate just means arrow-shaped. Sagittaria, probably Longiloba. And like so many members of the genus Sagittaria, which is uh, somewhat closely related to aeroids, it's in the same order the Monstera order, Aurelis. Uh, it's got the male flowers up top, which you can see with those, those yellow anthers and no swollen ovary beneath. And then the swollen ovaries, which are down here, uh, the, those flowers have already gone off. The petals have fallen off. They're, they got pollinated, uh, which had to have happened with pollen from another plant because the, they weren't going off at the same time the male flowers up top were going off. And so those will mature into the fruits as you can see. That's what an ovary is, it's just the fruit. Of course, I say it all the time. Hopefully, you guys are listening. But uh, Sagittaria, you know, that's what they do. Female flowers down below, male flowers up top. God, I can't wait to get cancer in a decade or two. We're all going to get cancer with all the shit they put in the environment. I'm really getting negative. Now, I'm sorry. You know, what will your cancer diagnosis be? Don't worry. You're not going to be alone. We're all going to be. Ah, fuck. We're all going to be with you. I'm sinking in here. I got to take the Crocs off. Oh, cool dragonfly. Oh, God, look, it's so fucking nasty. They just douse shit, all right? Even if they don't need to, the chemical companies got them so hooked. They're like drug pushers. Look at this fucking muck. Look at this carcinogenic muck. How much shit is in there? God, fuck Crocs. You know, if I was barefoot, this wouldn't be that bad. If I wasn't even wearing these fucking Crocs, this wouldn't be happening. I'm a mess. I'd just be just walking barefoot. You guys like watching me have a, a temper tantrum on, on a fucking TV or phone, whatever you're watching this on? You probably do. It's okay. Yeah, I'll let you. I'll let you watch. You know, you don't even have to pay. Oh. All right. I think I'm seeing a lot of the same thing. God, there is a lot of that heteranthera. What a cool plant, man. Coma linales, the order, the Tradescantia order, really has some cool looking flowers. You got to look at that. Look at Coma linales, especially Coma linaceae. There's some weird bastards in that family. Some really cool stamen morphology, dimorphic stamens, weird shit going on. I think there's buzz pollination too. You know, there's some really, look at, man, there's a plant with uh, spiral anthers too. What is it, cochleostema? That's a weird one. It's like an epiphyte. Ooh, what's in there? Oh, there's little water beetles and shit. That's nice. 
Hey, you got the frogs here. It can't be too bad, right? It can't be too toxic. Oh, this is cool. Look at this. So from that same family as the Sagittaria, which is right here with the arrow-shaped leaves, we have Echinodorus burderi from Elizmataceae, a wonderful family of aquatic plants. You can see this doesn't get as tall. Uh, it probably can grow submerged uh, up to a point, but obviously it's not going to flower if it's inundated, so it's more of a marginal plant. Uh, but the same flower structure going on. Three petals, three sepals. The petals are white. And, oh yeah, look, those are, the, those are the stamens. Are the flowers bisexual, I wonder? Really have to get in there and give them a proper rectal exam. That's what you get the 105 millimeter macro lens for. It looks like there might be an ovary in the center there with multiple stamens surrounding it, which is not what Sagittaria does. It actually has unisexual flowers and it breaks them up. But either way, you can see it's much smaller. Uh, petiole leaves are only about, I don't know, six inches tall. Ovate with the petiole, little uh, petal. And what this shit uh, from the family Elizmataceae. Elizmataceae is a really fucking cool family. Uh, and I think almost the whole family is aquatic. Are there any members of Elizmataceae that are not aquatic or that can stand not having their feet wet? I don't know. But anyway, it's very easy to assume that this pond is just left over. There were likely many more of them. The whole area was probably, you know, dimpled with little ponds like this before it was, you know, graded and then turned into agriculture and before the windmills. Yeah, that thing, that fucking windmill looks like it's having a bad time. Remember when a Texas freeze happened and our fucking governor tried to blame it on windmills? <laughs> God. Oh, it was 21. Any opportunity to exploit a crisis and turn it into a political stunt. Gotta love this state of Texas. Anyway, uh, all that aside, uh, this is really cool to see, especially with this rare plant. A lot of aquatic plants just get transported by birds. You know, the birds use the uh, wetlands as stepping stones and their migratory paths and, you know, disperse seeds. But that doesn't seem like that's what happened here. It seems like this is actually just left over from uh, what the whole area used to, you know, be like. It's just kind of you know, seasonally inundated marshland. I'm pretty sure this does dry. I mean, I'm sure it does dry up. You know, but it can also get flooded. I mean, they built the fucking bridge there anyway. But uh, I'm sure it does dry up at times. And then all this stuff just goes dormant, either to roots or to seeds that stay in the soil seed bank. So either way, little window into the past. Very fucking cool. I love things like this. I love things that, like this that help us, you know, get an idea of what was here before and what could come back at some point if we ever start designing our infrastructure with any fucking intelligence instead of just the lowest common denominator primate hoarding interests uh being front and center you know if we start actually being decent stewards of the land you know like uh human beings were here for many thousands of years uh before the europeans came and no, no no shame to the europeans no shame to them you know they likely uh the people that came here the culture that came here likely extirpated uh the people that stewarded the land properly back in europe you know and when they didn't uh, join up with the death cult they got wiped out and then the death cult uh, came across the ocean and moved west and brought those same mentalities over here and then did that with the indigenous people here. So anyway, I'm probably going to snag one of these so I can grow it at home and uh, if it dies, I'll just use it as a herbarium voucher and uh, put it into the university. But anyway, there you go. Head around through Mexicana. Shit ton of cool Elizmatesi. Some nice uh, loose stripe family members. Actually, just that one. Uh, that uh, that Amania, Coccinia, and... Uh, I didn't really go too deep. Then the Trichocronus right I'm pretty sure there's some other shit, but I got to get on the road. And I'm, uh, yeah, I'll be honest, I'm a little, little worried about getting doused with all the agriculture run up. Anyway, that's all I got. Have a good rest of your day. Be sure to look harder at your landscape and always be asking some fucking questions. That's all I got. Have a great rest of your day. Go fuck yourself. Bye. Fuck Crocs, okay? Fuck my toxic Crocs. By the way, have you ever actually looked? at cotton, at a cotton fruit up close, because that's all cotton is. It's just the material that surrounds the seeds. Like you can, I can feel it in there. Let's see if we can get it out. It's material that surrounds the seeds in the cotton plant. And uh, some other species of mallow do this too. Cotton is in the genus Gossipium, and you get some native Gossipian species in North America too. I've seen them in the Dominican Republic and in Sonora, Mexico, etc. So anyway, that's what it is. You got this, uh, appears to be four or five lobed fruit, dried dehiscent capsule fruit, and then the cotton is in the inside. Yeah, see, five would make sense, not four. That four must have just been, must have been an accident. A little mutation 
and the seeds are in there. So that cotton just protects the seeds and uh, was probably evolved uh, either as a protection mechanism or as a wind dispersal mechanism. But obviously these are not gonna be wind dispersed right now. That cotton's too thick. It's probably just a trait that's been reinforced through selective breeding. I don't know, I haven't looked into it. But uh, you're welcome to go, go hit the Google.